Okay, I think we'll kick into things. Um, so, kia ora koutou, welcome again. Um, wonderful to have you all joining us today. Um, my name is Alina Siegfried, um, and I look after the content and communications here at EHF. Um, I'm going to um, let our other panellists introduce themselves as well. So, Paula, do you want to kick that off? Yes, kia ora. Uh, I'm Paula, and I'm part uh, of operations and community support in Edmund Hillary Fellowship. Excited to be here with all these amazing women. Debbie? I'm Debbie. I'm part of the New Frontiers events team with EHF. And our fellows, uh, do you want to kick it off, Anne-Marie? Sure. Hi, um, I'm Anne-Marie Brook. I'm, how much of an introduction do you want? Just names at this stage? Or? Just a name and a brief yeah. introduction, I think, of, of, of the work that you're doing and sure. we'll have a chance to get more into your story a little later on. So I'm based here in Wellington, um, which is where the EHTF team is also based, and I'm one of the co-founders of an initiative that's producing human rights metrics for countries. Uh, Sonia? Uh, kia ora everyone, I am Sonia Renee Taylor. Um, I am the founder and radical executive officer of a digital media and education company called The Body Is Not An Apology. I'm also a performance poet and author. Beautiful. Very cool. Hi everyone, kia ora, hola. I am Dina and I am from Mexico. I am based between the US and New Zealand, currently in New York City. And I founded an organization called Education for Sharing with the mission of forming better citizens through the power of play uh, for all, all kinds of children uh, in every, every context. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'll kick into um, about five or ten minutes now to just quickly go through what is the Edmund Hillary Fellowship, um, what's it about, how can you apply, um, and we'll go through that reasonably quickly. So um, if you're interested in a, in a much more in-depth um, overview of, of, what, of the slide deck that I'm going to go through, it'll be worth checking out um, previous webinar recordings on our YouTube channel. Um, that's where we go much more into depth about the program itself. But today we are going to be um, focused on the, um, the the stories more of, of three of our incredible women fellows who have um, uh, yeah decided to join our call, which is um, which is very exciting. So um, I'm going to go through the next bit quite quickly. I'm just going to screen share here so that you can um, you can see our slides. Let me know if this is showing up for you. All right. So we're here to talk about the Edmund Hillary Fellowship. Um, what EHF is essentially is a, is a global community of entrepreneurs, um, investors and change makers who are solving global challenges um, at, based out of New Zealand. Um, and whether that's basing yourself physically in New Zealand or um, or working closely with New Zealand entrepreneurs and um, and basing yourself from wherever it is that makes sense for you right now, that's um, that's uh, something that's really up to everybody's individual circumstance. Um, but I want to emphasise that it is a, a global community that we are building. Um, we've got uh, fellows, we've got catalysts, um, we've got partners, we've got team who are working from all corners of the globe. And so that's what we're really focused on building as a, as a global community. Um, EHF is a platform um, for you to be able to collaborate with um, other like-minded people who are interested in, in improving the world and growing as, um, as individuals as well as uh, business people and entrepreneurs. Uh, we're aiming to provide a world-class support network. Um, so in the recognition that nobody does this kind of work alone, that we all need each other. And looking at fellows that are really interested in creating long-term connection with New Zealand. So really putting down roots here. And as I said a moment ago, whether that looks like um, immediately moving here and um, establishing a base for your operations here, or whether it means you might take a few more years to um, develop some of your um, business and project networks here, we're open to a few different options in that regard. 
We run a number of events every year, the, um, the big one of which is our New Frontiers Summits and Welcome Week Retreats for Fellows. And so we had the last one back in April where we welcomed Cohort 2. Um, the next one is in October, November, and we'll be welcoming Cohort 3, which we've just recently selected. Um, throughout sort of the rest of the year, we have um, smaller regional gatherings in different cities. And a lot of this is being driven by the fellows, um, depending on where they are. So we've got, you know, quite strong communities popping up in, in Christchurch in Wellington, um, a little bit in Auckland as well, um, and, and in some of the regions as well. Nelson's got quite a quite a, um, a, a good mass of, of fellows that are looking to settle there. So um, a lot of that will be quite emergent over the next few years as the community grows. Um, we've got a space for online connect, connection and um, collaborating with your other fellows, and that's a... Um, community that we're continuing to build up and experiment with new tools um, on. And then you've got the EHF's team, which um, which also aims to support um, people on a more of a one-on-one -on -one basis, depending on what your individual needs are. So this is just a bit of a sense of um, what our New Frontiers gatherings um, look like. There's a lot of focus on informal space and time and um, just sitting around in circles and and uh, people very much um, driving the conversation, so um, putting up their hand to co-host specific sessions. There's there's a chance for um, you know exploring some new technologies and so on, and and really kind of uh, connecting on a person-to-person -person level as well. So a few um, thoughts now on why why New Zealand? Why have we chosen New Zealand to be um, this, this base camp for a better world, this home of global impact. Um, and there are a few reasons why, um, you know, or, or reasons that make ideal, uh, New Zealand ideal for being um, a place where you can test and incubate new, new impact-based ideas. So um, historically, we have a very strong record of, um, of civil liberties and, um, and political rights. We're the least country, uh, corrupt country in the world, the second most peaceful country. Um, we've, we're the first country in the world to give women the right to vote, which is, is a point that I'm particularly proud of. Um, while we're not at all uh, perfect, um, I think it's um, really cool that we've been a leader for a lot of the Western world in um, healing some of the wounds of colonization around indigenous relationships and rights. Um, we have the Treaty of Waitangi here in New Zealand, which is the founding document of our nation between the Maori people and the, um, the Pākehā settlers. And generally um, leading a lot of the world ranks in um, generosity, diversity and happiness. Um, Auckland is the second most diverse city in the world, I believe, after Vancouver. So it's Auckland is more diverse than New York and, and London and some of those other big um, big hubs, so it's, a, it's an exciting place to be. It's also um, really great in terms of scaling early stage ventures and trying out new ideas here. So um, World Bank has called us first in the world for ease of doing business. Um, our particular geographic location means that we have pretty good strong relationships with, with both the East and the West. Um, we've got a well-educated workforce so you can find um, staff for your, for your companies here. And generally, um, very flexible. So um, New Zealand is small enough that you can, you know, you can get a CEO on the phone or you can talk to an elected official and you can actually um, talk to the decision makers here and, and test new ideas and get things done, which is, um, yeah, really creates an atmosphere conducive to innovation. Just briefly going to go through a few of our, um, our companies who have come out of New Zealand whose names you might recognise, some who you may not. Um, Weta Digital, of course, is um, is one of Wellington's uh, biggest exports. Um, they did Avatar, Lord of the Rings, King Kong, um, lots of big Hollywood blockbusters, um, and, and really pushing the, the boundaries of digital effects there. Zero is um, a accounting firm which have just made really um, sleek, easy to use accounting software. Um, several billion dollar valuations. So that's one of our bigger uh, tech success stories. Um, 
A bit closer to home, we've got examples like sun-fed meats who are uh, using pea proteins and vegetable proteins to um, create replacement chicken products, which are, I think, quite... Um, I, I haven't tried them yet, but I've heard they're quite... Um, uh, convincing and so really looking at lowering the uh, environmental impact of, of protein productions and the Inspiral Network is a really cool um, I guess collaborative experiment that was born out of Wellington and is a network of about 300 freelancers, creatives, entrepreneurs, um, investors um, and uh, artists that are all um, uh, working under the umbrella of stuff that matters um, and they tend to work as a, a non-hierarchical um, platform cooperative type of model where, where the members of the network really, really drive what's going on. So that's a really cool experiment in participatory decision-making there at Inspiral. Um, talk a little bit about who we're um, looking for in terms of our fellows, the kind of qualities we're looking for, and we'll briefly cover how to get involved as well. So... Here's our selection criteria, and as I said, I'm going through this quite quickly. You can have a look on YouTube if you want to dive more in detail or on our website. But we're looking for people who have a really bold vision to solve um, systemic challenges and interconnected challenges in society and who are focused on, on creating positive impact and looking at new ways of doing things. We're looking for those who have um, demonstrated the capability and, desire and drive to actually execute on their visions and, and deliver on the, on the things they say that they want to do. Those who can build long-term connections with this country and um, leverage some of those um, unique advantages and qualities that I mentioned before on, um, on developing innovative products. Those who are really interested in contributing to a global community. So going back to that idea of EHF, the strength of it really being the community and the way that people help each other out. And so people that are interested in, in being part of that family over the next 10 to 20 years, rather than just um, participating in a, in a short program and then moving on. And then, of course, people who generally are going to be um, great ambassadors for New Zealand and help uh, promote New Zealand innovation and, and New Zealand social enterprise and impact on the global stage. And there's a little brief mention there of some of the values that EHF um, looks for in fellows, including boldness, um, excellence, uh, global impact, interconnectedness, um, and a spirit of kaitiakitanga, which is um, loosely translated as, as stewardship as well. You can find out more on our website there, ehf.org forward slash apply. Now, how to get involved. Um, we're currently recruiting for cohort four applications at the moment. Um, we have an early bird deadline coming up on the 1st of August. So in New Zealand, that's tomorrow, but for much of the rest of the world, it's the day after. So there are still two days um, to apply for Cohort 4 and make, um, take advantage of early bird pricing, which I think is, is $100 off the application fee. And then our final Cohort uh, 4 deadline is the 2nd of September. Um, we'll be going through the selection process after that between September and November and be letting fellows, uh, the successful fellows know at that point um, whether or not they've been selected. And that, that process involves um, a number of steps um, and shortlisting um, processes throughout that, some video interviews for some and, and so on. Um, the Global Impact Visa is something that happens uh, separately and after you've been um, accepted into EHF. So accept, acceptance into EHF is the first step. Um, and we hope by that stage you will have already done your homework as to whether you can qualify for a global impact visa in terms of health and character requirements. Um, and so at that point, you do the, um, the formal application with Immigration New Zealand. And we're looking at uh, March 2019 for Welcome Week for Cohort 4 in New Zealand. And um, attendance at that Welcome Week is, um, is compulsory. And it's, um, it's really, I think, some of the, the fellows can speak to shortly um, incredible um, opportunity to get to know your cohort and really build some deep connections there in a, um, in a beautiful place and, and um, get to know each other as people as well as, um, as the, the projects and the, and the, the businesses. Um, I've just covered off that, so a couple more days left to get your early bird applications in. Some brief just instructions here on how to apply. 
you can go to the apply page on our website. If you're not quite ready to apply, but you'd like to tell us about your idea and just kind of run it past us, you can express interest on our website to receive updates, um, ehf.org slash connect. Um, and we will do our best to reach out to, um, to those people who are most aligned with the program. Um, the, our fee structure is such that um, part of the fee is payable on, on application when you first apply. And then if you're accepted into the program, there is also um, a, uh, an acceptance fee, essentially, that, that only those who, who make it through all the stages have to pay as well. So that opens it up a little bit more to those who, um, who just want to give it a go and, um, and don't necessarily have to pay the whole free fee up front. We do have scholarships available um, for a couple more days. These are needs-based, so you, you can find um, details about that on the apply page on our website. Um, and that uh, those are available for international entrepreneur applicants only. The New Zealand um, entrepreneur price is already hev heavily subsidised. Um, so the, the price for, for application fees for Kiwis is, is quite a bit lower than, um, than the international um, entrepreneurs and investors. So at this stage, I would love to hand it over to, um, to Anne-Marie uh, to tell us a little bit more um, about your journey into EHF, um, how you've been finding the program and anything else you'd love to, to chat about. Kia ora. Thanks, Alina. Um, so, um, yeah, my, I guess my journey is I actually started off life as an economist, my professional life, not my entire life. <laughs> um, and I, I found myself at some point becoming really, really interested in human rights and what, different, what difference government respect for human rights could make to economic development and people's lives. Um, and as an economist, um, I wanted to use data to explore relationships between um, respect for human rights and economic development and so forth. And I realized that there wasn't any such data. Um, and over a long period of several years, I reached out to numerous people around the world and we ended up um, founding the initiative, Human Rights Measurement Initiative. At the time that I applied for EHF, so I was applying for the first cohort, um, and that was kind of first half of last year. Um, I was really attracted to it in part because um, I was, I was feeling a little bit lonely in my entrepreneurial journey. And so I was looking for a, a network of people who um, could, you know, I could share, you know, the challenges and who could provide that kind of support of what it's like to be an entrepreneur and the kind of roller coaster ride that that involves. Um, and also, um, I thought that EHF would help to build my profile as a relatively new um, entrepreneur and all those things have turned out to be more than true. I've been really, really happy with, um, you know, I was so excited to be accepted. It's been a wonderful experience for me to be part of this wonderful um, network of people, all who are caring, really caring about having global impact. It's in so many different ways and at so many different levels. Um, and yeah, it's, I would say, you know, one of the, one of the questions that, Kind of Alina said to, to focus on was how does what how does how has my experience compared with what I expected? I was expecting it to be great, but it's been even better. So, is there anything else that you wanted me to cover that I haven't specifically spoken to? Okay. Perhaps a little bit about um, how EHF has specifically helped in, in the type of work that you're doing. It'd be it'd be great to hear a little bit more about um, the Human Rights Measurement Initiative and. Um, and how the connections can, can help you? Yeah, so, you know, I think in some ways what I'm doing is, you know, there's, there's no one else, at least that I'm aware of so far in the community who's working directly on human rights. I think for some people, they're working on topics where there's a lot of alignment very closely with other fellows, and some of them have actually started working together and really co-creating things. For me, I, I expect there probably will be more of a community that we can build around those issues in the future. But so far, what I've noticed in terms of the um, connections have been, um, you know, it's a very global project and EHF helps to provide that global profile that, 
that, that may, may have been harder to build from New Zealand, you know, in, in terms of starting a new initiative. Um, we are working with countries all around the world. We have a we have an expert survey, a, pro, a survey that we send to human rights experts in countries around the world to, to seek information from them about what's actually happening on the ground in those countries. I think there's lots of scope um, for the actual connections within AHF around my work to be built further. But even already, I would say that the biggest impact for me personally has been the profile raising and the personal support and um, collaboration just from other fellows and from sharing experiences and um, getting that kind of more personal support. Fantastic. Um, thank you, Anne-Marie. Um, I think what we'll do is, is hear from some of our other fellows at this point and we'll leave um, a lot of time at the end for questions and and perhaps um, diving into specifically um, some of those angles that our participants want to know a little more about. I see Amy's got a question here um, about exactly what's involved in EHF. Um, really great question. We'll um, we'll get to that, I think, um, a little bit later, but we'll, in the meantime, it'll be um, wonderful to hear a little bit from uh, Sonia, if you'd like to take the mic. I know you're sure. very good at taking the mic. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, hmm. My journey to EHF uh, was very sort of serendipitous and accidental. Um, I was, uh, the first time that I came to New Zealand was in 2009. I was invited um, as a poet for the Auckland Writers uh, Festival. And I was here for 10 days and I fell in love and I was like, I love that place and I would love to go back one day. Um, and so in between that time, 20, not 2009 and 2017, um, I had gone from being a performance poet um, to accidentally, <laughs> which seems to be a theme in my life, accidentally things happen, uh, accidentally uh, stumbling into my work um, with uh, my company, The Body Is Not An Apology. Um, like I said, we're a digital media and education company who looks at the intersection of identity and social justice and using a framework we call radical self-love. Um, and so really looking at how do we interrupt uh, body-based oppression by shifting the way that we understand and relate to our own bodies and the bodies of other people. Um, and so for my 40th birthday in 2016, I decided I was going to do something absurd and gift myself a trip back to New Zealand um, to see if I loved it as much as I thought I did. Uh, the second day that I was there, a friend in introduced me over the internet to another friend who lived in Auckland, and that friend happened to be having a birthday party and asked if this random stranger would like to come. <laughs> and I was like, sure, I'd love to. Uh, and at the end of the party, it's just she and I and her husband, we're sitting around and talking. Um, and she's like, I'm really excited about this project that I'm working on that is uh, bringing social impact entrepreneurs um, to incubate global impact projects from New Zealand. And I was like, that sounds very fascinating. <laughs> I wanna know more. Uh, and so she sent me a, the interest letter for this thing that was totally new, that had not even really been kicked off yet. Um, but I was, I was immediately intrigued. I was intrigued because of the sort of powerful um, capacity for change that I think New Zealand has, the ability to, to quickly adopt an idea and then have it reach scale, one because of size and also because of sort of location and that sort of thing. Um, I was really inspired by um, the relationship um, of the country with its indigenous community um, while not being perfect, light years away from the way that that relationship looks in the US. Um, and so I was just really intrigued and wanted to know more. I sent in an, uh, I sent in an interest letter and the last day of my trip, um, uh, Alina and um, Yosef, who uh, is the CEO, sort of head of the project, uh, invited me in to talk. Unbeknownst to me at that time, Alina was like, I already know you. You judged me in a poetry slam, <laughs> which was hilarious. Um, and so that sort of got the ball rolling. Uh, that conversation really solidified for me that there was a vision 
that EHF is holding as it relates to um, what are interesting, creative, innovative things that folks are doing um, that can change the world. And that was something that I was inspired and interested in. Um, and so I knew that I was going to apply and it all happened really quickly. Um, I applied for the push cohort, um, found out in the late summer and decided I was going to move my life to New Zealand uh, to, to do this work. And so um, I've been here between here and the US since October. Fantastic. And, and how have you found um, New Zealand so far in terms of um, being a place where, where you can build your work on your work? Um, it's, it's been really amazing. Um, one of the things that I think has been most powerful about EHF is connection, is the way in which someone knows someone who's, who knows that you're the exact person for the thing, um, whatever the thing is. Um, and so, um, so much of the relationships that I've built have been someone saying, oh, you need to talk to so-and-so. And then I talk to so-and-so and then all of these things open up. So um, it's, it's, it's fascinating. New Zealand is two degrees. I want to say it's one degree of separation, um, <laughs> literally. Uh, so I ended up um, being covered on a news story for a workshop that I did here, which I got as a result of someone in the fellowship introducing me to someone else. Um, and that news story is national. And so then I walked into the motor vehicle place to get my car fixed. And the lady was like, I know you. You're the radical self-love lady. <laughs> and so that's actually been happening around the country. Uh, so, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty visible. Uh, but beyond that, uh, there's just a way in which ideas can spark really quickly here. Um, and I think EHF has created the container for that to happen. Okay. Thank you, Sonia. Um, Dina, we'd love to hear a little bit about your story and how you came to EHF and how you've been um, finding the experience so far. You're in a you're a fellow in our second cohort. So Anne Marie and, and Sonia uh, are in cohort one, and Dina joins uh, cohort two. So over to you. Hey, thank you so much. Yeah, it's just a tremendous community that that I've been uh, so privileged to join. The EHF is, is really, I think, one of the most uh, amazing and brilliant communities because you are suddenly surrounded by brilliant minds, but really also simultaneously brilliant hearts. And that combination, I think it's, it's just so powerful. And it's it's the essence of of VHF, and um, it's just inviting you to to become a part of a very diverse community from all over the world, from very different passions with the same uh, really vision of changing the world. I was in love with with this vision because um, when when I met. Uh, the EHF team, I was like, wow, you are inviting us to go to this beautiful place, uh, far or near relatively, uh, and, and you're inviting us to create from there to the rest of the world and to learn from other people's solutions and from other people's expertise areas. Um, and so I, I was really, really moved by by the vision and knowing that when you talk to each person at EHF team and the other fellows, you know that you're talking with real real people and intentions go beyond intentions. No, they they really reach uh, a very concrete and tangible uh, place. And so, I. Yes, I mean, I, I was also like Sonia in love with New Zealand from the moment I, I had the opportunity to to be there for the first time. I was an exchange an exchange student in Dunedin, the south of the South Island, um, in 2004. And so when, when I return now with my family as a whatever grown-up means, um, I, I met 
Joseph and he was sharing about the, this idea that they were already working on and, and I, it, it just clicked, you know, it made a lot of sense. Uh, dedicating my life to forming better citizens from young ages through the power of play and re realizing that in, in, in my mind a better citizen is someone that has a purpose and that that purpose involves like a greater, a greater um, ambition beyond oneself is like a, what makes you happy, what makes you your heart beat. Uh, and when you realize from a young age that it, what really makes your heart beat is uh, being able to contribute to other people's lives, then uh, it, it, everything makes sense. And when I understood that beyond the seven Latin American countries where we are operating and the US, uh, we could reach like the whole world from New Zealand, it just made a, the most amazing uh, sense in, in our whole system. Uh, I shared this with my team and my team in Mexico was like, this sounds crazy, crazily, amazingly. And, and they were really uh, enjoying already the, the vision of, of what this could mean, you know? And just like Sonia was, was sharing, um, I had a very similar experience. Being from cohort two, I, uh, we were in New Zealand in April and May, and just the kind of connections that the AHF allows, and the kind of welcome that you receive from people. I was living again in Dunedin, and um, it's just how fast do ideas take they're a life of their own, no? And, and how people are super receptive and just so willing to share and to learn and to collaborate and co-create. This is a kind of atmosphere that I have found in New Zealand. And yes, just like, like as a very uh, fun and, and interesting example, I guess, it's in other countries where we've tried to, where we've set up a legal structure, it can take uh, up to two years and the the EHF connected us to some pro bono lawyers who were going to help us um, establish legally and, and they said well it takes two weeks and I, I was I thought they were joking huh coming from from Latin America this just seems like a like a fun joke but it's it's real no and so and, and people are very, very well, well intentioned and super hardworking. And so it's an environment where everything happens. Um, so if you are listening from Latin America or from anywhere, uh, anywhere that you've experienced like very tough bureaucratic processes, I think you'll, you'll just be blown away by, by New Zealand's a tremendously agile system no and and that that's very uplifting uh, because because then you can really start um collaborating with the government and with the business community uh, and with other entrepreneurs and it just it's not an obstacle so i think it like really you you find a very easy way to to navigate the system which is huge uh, Plus, uh, it is a very diverse country. I'm also in love with uh, the culture and the respect that's paid to the to the language and to the traditions and to, uh, of course, like Alina and Sonia have said, it's not perfect, but it's just coming from Mexico and uh, I feel super identified in the sense that we also have a very strong cultural uh, wealth. However, we have not been close, close to, to recognizing and acknowledging that uh, in, a way, in a way that New Zealand has. So uh, it's very, very inspiring. And I'm, I'm just thrilled to see how fast things are moving forward. 
uh, whether you're an investor or a social entrepreneur, I think there is there is just so so much opportunity to to make things happen from New Zealand to the rest of the world. Mm. Dina, you you mentioned before that this is like a um, you're finding it a, a really great place to um, conduct some of your work. Um, do you want to just talk just for a couple of minutes briefly, and then we'll get into some questions? But about uh, what 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 is the the way the, that you use the the power of play? What kind of things are you are you teaching our young people? What's the the basis? Of yes, it? basically because we want children to to discover the what what they're passionate about and what kind of issues bring them together uh, and they can work together on. So the games that we play are related with the sustainable development goals from UN, which are the major global challenges. And this may may sound very abstract or or so far away because they are subjects such as uh, ending poverty, ending hunger. Uh, and, and so through play, it's a super powerful way to experience these issues, inequality, health, environment uh, issues, but in a way that allows you to, to be, become a part of the solution and to come up with your own conclusions in a fun, healthy, engaging way on how you want to, what kind of, of actor you're going to be in your community uh, and how how do you want to uh, to to roll out this purpose that you've that you've found no in a in a way that allows you to have a better relationship with your parents with your teachers because we train teachers with this methodology so that they can implement uh, a way i mean their teaching in a fun way and always including the subjects of the sustainable development goals so that children not only learn about what they are, but they can tell you what they are going to do from their communities or what they've done from their communities to address them in a very concrete way. So it's, it's very, very powerful. And now listening to Brooke, I was, I was thinking, wow, we have to work together because you know, if, you, if you have found a way to measure the human rights uh, in an innovative way, I think this is very much uh, on a very similar on a, on a very similar thread and that 's what happens that 's the magic that happens when you meet the other fellows. you just start uh, your your mind starts going to a thousand hundred places uh, at least no where all the synergies that can happen and how much you can learn from each other. And fellows really become your family. So you, I don't have to know Brooke before and Marie, and Marie uh, from before. Uh, I just know she's an EHA fellow, and there is an immediate trust and connection, and feeling like like we are part of the same community. So, so I'm just thrilled too. A few of our fellows have spoken to the uh, the the power of. Sorry to interrupt. I'm just conscious of time. Um, Yes. Uh, the, the, the power of the, the community, I think, and the connections. So I wondered if it might be a great idea to just um, have Debbie just say for a couple of minutes um, how we design the Welcome Week experience to try and really foster those um, those deep connections between uh, fellows. And just mm -hmm. a reminder, you can, you can ask um, fellows, um, our, uh, sorry, ask questions of our fellows or ask questions of our team through the Q&A box. Um, and we'll address those shortly. So just to let, let you know and remind you to keep those questions coming if you've got them. So the Welcome Week is a chance for all our new fellows to come together and, as Alina said, form deep connections um, through its, its full immersion. So basically we, we all stay out in a glamping village together, close to nature, um, with opportunities to hear, from, hear each other's stories but also get to know people as people before hearing um, about their yeah, about their work that they do, or their stories. Going from there into New Frontiers um, is an opportunity to connect with the, the wider community. So it really is a chance to form connections in a, in, a, in a space where, yeah, people can hear the stories, which really gives an idea of um, what everyone, are, what people are doing. Hearing from our international speakers as well, international and local speakers um, 
yeah, to get a sense of the community, connecting to the community. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, thank you, Debbie. Um, I thought uh, Amy's got a question here around, uh, it'll be great to know exactly what's involved um, in EHF. Um, so that's that's a really great question. We're, um, we're, we're quite focused on building the connections between the fellows and then letting, letting a lot of the, that work happen in a, in a more self-directed way. So EHF is not an accelerator program, it's not an incubator. Um, there are some uh, overlapping threads of those kinds of models, but essentially what we're building, and I keep coming back to this concept of community. So it's a fellowship community that supports each other. Um, the ways that fellows are going about their work is quite diverse. Um, so some are, are building new companies, some are, um, you know, have got um, companies that are that are mature or definitely move beyond the startup phase to actually um, the the stay up phase, as I call it. <laughs> um, and and we've got people who have you know built um, billion dollar companies. Um, in, in California as well, and then um, and then some who are very much operating at the in the grassroots and community level, and so we've um, we've really not we're not um, I guess in the business of directing how you should go about your work, but we're here as a support network in a community um, for, um, for for whatever makes sense for you. Um, so really, what you get out of the program is um, is what you put in. Um, there's a few questions here that I think we can put to some of our um, our fellows. So, um, first quick one from Nicole, um, and let's let's try to keep um, answers to to around about a minute because we've got a few questions to get through. But um, curious to hear from our fellows. Um, have you always seen yourselves as entrepreneurs? Well, um, I can start by answering that. Um, I would say that at a, at a level, yes, I always wanted to be developing new ways of making the world a better place. And actually, when I was in more conventional jobs, when I was being employed as an economist, I often used to feel slightly envious of um, people who would label themselves entrepreneurs um, and kind of think, oh, I wish, I wish I was doing something a little bit more entrepreneurial. So I always had that running through my blood. And when um, it came to the, came to the decision point where I actually jumped off my more conventional path into being a more explicitly self-labeled social entrepreneur, it was a really, it was an exciting time for me. Um, Sonia or Dina, have you got um, any thoughts on that on that question? Have you always seen yourself as entrepreneurs? Uh, um, Sonia? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, I mean, I, I started when I was 24 years old and this, this was my first job. So I, I didn't have a, a clear idea of, uh, actually, I've never heard the word social entrepreneur before in my life. I didn't know I was one, but then I, someone told me that that was what I was doing. And yes, I just kept going. Nice. So a bit of a variation there um, between, between our fellows. Um, Alana's got a fantastic question here um, to, to explore what, what the fellows experience. How has the experience been um, as women in the program? Um, our uh, most recent cohort is um, a little bit skewed in the favour of, of, um, of male fellows. We started out really well with a 50-50 split in cohort one, um, which we were really proud of, um, that we've, we've found in, um, in cohort three. Um, we've ended up with, um, yeah, a lot, a lot more male participants and, and less of a uh, gender equality than we would have liked. So curious to hear fellows' um, experiences as women in the program, and perhaps if you've even got any ideas of, um, of how we can refer great women to come through um, and apply for the program um, so we can look at actually um, rectifying that split a little bit. Any comments on that? Uh, Sonia, you're on mute, but I see you've heard a talk, so. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think that, I mean, as a woman, in the, I mean, I think in some ways I, I actually have what's a really unique situation and the fact that I'm a single 
woman in the fellowship, a single black woman in the fellowship who moved to New Zealand. Um, and I'm, not, I'm the only one of all of those things. <laughs> Um, and so I do think that the um, there is a bit of a sort of kind of choose your own adventure story that I think the fellowship offers, which is, um, you know, you've got to come with some vision and you've got to come with a willingness to kind of risk in a way that I think we don't always encourage women societally to do. Um, and so I think there is some just convince some reminding um, women that that actually we risk all the time and oftentimes we risk in service to other people's visions rather than risking in service to our own. So I think there's something about that narrative that's important to get out in the world. And I also think um, that there's a, just a level of intentionality in any place where there is inherently a gender skew. And the reality is that in the startup and the entrepreneurial world, there is a gender skewing towards males um, because they're because of privilege and because of patriarchy and sexism and all of those isms that live in the world, um, which means that we've got to be exceptionally intentional about um, doing a level of recruitment to women that makes it even. Like we've got to push harder towards women in order to end up with 50-50 rather than hoping that it'll just kind of work out in the wash. And so I'm really glad about this particular um, webinar because it's part of that like direct focus towards telling women entrepreneurs. And one of the things that I would say is I, I've met lots of women who've been like, oh, I don't know if my idea is good enough. I think that kind of self-talk that women do about not being good enough keeps us from applying to things like this. And it's one of the things we've got to get rid of. Yes, that classic dilemma that women, women who are like 90% qualified will not put themselves forward. Well, often men who are 40% qualified won't hesitate. <laughs> exactly. Um, have any of either of our other fellows, Dina or Anne-Marie, have you got any um, thoughts to speak um, to that question at all? I think it's it's understandable that, um, for example, I have family. I have a, a two-year-old daughter and, and my husband, and I think it, it can pose a, a, a challenge, an extra challenge, to think of how do I move with my family and how do I do this because logistically it can be it can be a, quite an adventure and and I I'm happy to say that it is an adventure and and it's fun and it helps you uh, grow and I think there are a lot of different ways to to navigate um, each situation so I would I would certainly encourage. Um, women who are who are having these sort of questions around what do I do if I want to move, but I have a family, and uh, I would I would love to uh, to invite them to also talk with with me uh, or other women that are, that have that are part of the fellows that have families because it's it's just. Um, a matter of 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 understanding the the different uh, logistical uh, pathways no and and it is possible i can tell you from experience uh, nothing is nothing is supposed to be uh, a piece of cake but but you can do it and you can always find solutions and you can always um have this come uh, come and goes with uh, with the other fellows and with the HF team to help you navigate because you're never alone and that's I think very important when you join this community. Mm. Yep. Just briefly, any anything from you, Anne Marie? Otherwise, we've got a couple of questions that I'll um, I can um, answer from a logistical perspective. Yeah, I think I would just reinforce what Sonia and Dina have said. I do think that you know women need to more consciously believe in themselves because we do have those tend to have those internal voices and i i had exactly that thing that you mentioned you know there was a voice inside of me going no no, no you're not good enough to be a fellow and i had to kind of override that to bring myself to apply and i think not only do we need to encourage ourselves but also encourage those we know um and you know talking about the fact that there is though there are those different um 
biases that we have as men versus women, I think making people consciously aware of that can really help. And, you know, I also, I'm also a mother, I've also got a young child, and so, I mean, it's easier for me because I'm already based in New Zealand, but again, I would just reinforce um, Dina's point that there's lots of different ways to do things. What's one of the beauties of EHF is that there's no set path. Everybody makes their own path. Um, and the other thing I'd say is that the community itself is just so incredibly supportive. There's no expectations to conform to anything in particular. It's a community that's going to celebrate you being who you are and the wonderful, the wonderful vision that you have in whichever niche area that is. So it really is a beautiful place to be as a woman. Mm, thank you. Thank you, Anne-Marie. And we've got a few more questions here I'd love to just get to. Um, Amy's asking about financial support, the requirement for fellows to be um, in New Zealand. Um, a nice uh, bonus of the of EHF and the Global Impact Visa is that there is no minimum day requirement to be in New Zealand. It's a very flexible visa in that regard um, and, and really is, is in response to the fact that we recognise our fellows that are making global impact in a lot of different ways and that doesn't always necessarily mean that they need to be based physically in New Zealand for a certain amount of days each year. So um, it's very flexible in terms of travel. Financial support we are unable to offer. Um, we're not, as I said, an incubator or accelerator program, so we don't provide um, any financial support. You you are in the driver's seat to um, to um, facilitate investment into your own companies. The flip side of that is that EHF doesn't take any equity in any of our fellows. Um, uh, companies or ventures. What we can do is help provide connections to uh, networks and investors and so on that, that may be able to um, help you with financial assistance. Um, Hetty has a question here, which is the criteria uh, used to qualify. Um, so that's something I went over uh, just briefly earlier on in terms of having a bold vision, um, being able to actually demonstrate that you've either got a, a track record of, of um, executing on projects and that doesn't necessarily have to be you've you've started X number of, of ventures. Um, it could be community-based projects, volunteer projects, um, NGOs. There's a lot of different ways we can look at your track record and, and see that you have a history of actually following through on a vision. Um, Connection to New Zealand, um, does your idea make sense? Um, would you benefit from being part of the network? And these are all things that we don't ne we don't necessarily have a set of uh, checkbox checkbox measures that we that we tick um, candidates up against. We um, we use um, a, a, a sort of a multi a multi lens approach to looking at um, applications through written um, video video interviews. Um, reference checks, doing um, a lot of background research on our candidates, and um, and and also important to remember that because the EHF is a competitive program, um, your chances of of being successful as a fellow are going to vary from cohort to cohort depending on who else is applying as well, because we do look at um, one of the final steps is the cohort as a whole. Does this cohort make sense as a community of people? Do we think they have complementary skills that, that could help each other out? Do we have, um, you know, somebody working working in one industry or do we have too many people in, in another industry? So that we, we do look at the cohort as a whole as one of our final selection steps. Um, just, we've, we've finished up the questions in the Q&A box. Um, there was a couple of questions I think that came through in the chat window as well. Um, Simone has asked, does EHF give opportunities to carry out research-based projects? Um, that's a great question, and the short answer is generally not. Um, what we're looking for is, um, is, is, is projects that, that have scalability potential. Uh, but it's not, it's not black and white, so um, we, we take a, um, a sort of a very one-on-one one one-to-one case-by-case approach to those sorts of things. If you are talking about, um, you know, a research project through a university or something like that, then um, then we'd probably be looking for something that's um, certainly able to be um, scaled globally, if not commercialised. Um, but then there are, you know, there's some fellows, um, Anne-Marie, for example, there's a lot of a, bit, a big research component to your project as well. 
Um, so it's not it's not purely just we're looking for commercial businesses. Um, it's it's probably um, more of the focus. Um, but yeah, it's not a, it's not a clean cut answer. Sorry, you you're always welcome to put through an expression of interest um, on our website as well through um, that ehf.org forward slash connect and tell us about the idea there and we'll um, and we can get in touch if it, if it seems like a good fit. Um, any other questions to come through? Do you require fellows to incorporate their firms in New Zealand? Um, from Marie. Um, no, we don't. Um, some of our um, fellows um, have already incorporated their firms overseas and that and it makes sense for them to be based there still. Um, they may look at setting up an office or some sort of a side arm of their organisation here in New Zealand. Um, others, it just makes sense to keep on operating from where they are, but perhaps start taking on some New Zealand clients or um, collaborating with other New Zealand fellows um, or, or entrepreneurs here as well. We have uh, one minute left, so if any uh, any keen beans there uh, want to get last question through, then you're then you're welcome to. I'll leave it for another, another few seconds there. You're welcome, Nicole. <laughs> <laughs> um, and just going back to, um, I think the conversation around how how we can really encourage a lot more women entrepreneurs to apply for EHF. Um, please let your networks of incredible women know about the program, uh, women and in, in other marginalised uh, genders as well, um, and just let them know this is available. Um, that we want to support. That we want to support you, and we'd love you to put your name forward. Um, so those that are on the webinar, please share it. If you're watching on YouTube, you know there's a big share button down there. Um, make use of it. Um, it'd be fantastic to see a lot more um, really, yeah, strong, strong Wahine women coming to this program as well. We are on three o'clock, so I think we will um, we will cut it off there. Um, and yeah, you can reach out to our team through the website if you do have any additional questions. I want to thank our fellows immensely, uh, Sonia, and marie It looks like we've lost Dina. But um, yeah, a million thank yous for your time this afternoon. It's been fantastic chatting with you. Bye. See you later, everybody. Bye. Thank you.